Welcome to Africa Tea. I'm Vivian Burchell, your host. I'm excited to say that Africa is at the forefront of bringing other disadvantaged communities together on a world stage to bridge healthcare gaps. Harvard's Global Health Cutlist Program, which was started by my guest, Dr. Wilfred Ngoa, to bridge the healthcare gap in low and middle income countries around the world through collaborations with more advanced economies. The Global Health Cutlist seeks to engage in high level conversations and translate them into policy at national, bilateral, regional, and international levels. During the, the recent Global Health Cutlist Summit, I had the opportunity to chat with government leaders, diplomats, healthcare professionals, and advocates from across the world. Some were seeking new collaborations to help their communities, including representatives from Pakistan and the Pan-African Parliament and Jamaica's Minister of Commerce, Trade, Animals, and Fisheries. Over the years of the Global Health Cutlist Program, international relations have been built through these partnerships, Growing global collaborations between people interested in cancer care and research has been an important result of the Global Health Cutlist. The program has attracted educational platforms like eCancer, led to the creation of tumor boards, engaged radiation oncologists, neurosurgeons, and many other advocates for global cancer care and treatment. It is not surprising that I recently heard from a Global Health Cutlist collaborator in Germany whose Rotary Club has an exchange program for oncology nurses, who works with the solar power technology for radiotherapy and automation and digitization, and is seeking to build a network of Rotarians to advocate for the creation of global programs to fight cancer in low and middle income countries. Modern healthcare professionals have recognized the need for holistic healthcare approaches that incorporate indigenous and multi-generational knowledge and the Global Health Cutlist is no exception. This year, one of the significant outcomes of the Cutlist program was the launch of the International Fight for Medicines Institute, which Dr. Ngwa will tell us more about. It is worth noting that the plant-based medicine is not a new concept. In Africa uh, and other parts of the world, plant-based medicine has for centuries been used to treat tropical diseases and other medicine, medical complications. Modern healthcare professionals are presently applying science to the herbs that have been used for centuries by indigenous communities around the world. In recent weeks, I have browsed through different books on plant-based and herbal medicine. It has been interesting to learn about the different plants and where they are believed to originate. It is also interesting to read about the chemistry and pharmacology of these plants. Of course, I'm not a scientist, but the fact that there is literature explaining the scientific significance of some of these plants takes us back to the conversation on the significance of indigenous medicine in bridging healthcare gaps. In a, of course, in my previous episode, I talked about bridging Africa's healthcare gaps with ethnomedicine. And in my opinion, ethnomedicine, phytomedicine are both terms for indigenous plant-based medicine. The words have changed, but the concept is the same. This is medicine that indigenous populations have used for centuries. It is used to resolve healthcare issues that have caused social and economic impact to the communities. Improving these plant-based medicines would help bridge the healthcare gap and would also be a catalyst for enabling social economic development. Agro-based medicines would not only keep the communities healthy, but also provide markets for the farmers of these plants and catalyze preservation of indigenous plants. It makes sense for indigenous he healthcare providers, pharmacologists, and medical doctors to collaborate on phytomedicines medicines to provide additional knowledge through extensive research on formulation, dosages, and quality control. It is important to note that these products should also be reviewed for safety and efficacy by healthcare regulators like our Food and Drug Administration or its equivalent in other countries. With that, I would like to invite Dr. Wilfred Ngwa to talk about uh, his work with the Global Health Catalyst and specifically the Phytomedicines Institute. Dr. Wilfred, welcome to Africa to you. Thank you very much, Vivian. Uh, tell us about yourself for those people who don't actually know you. 
and your role with the Global Health Catalyst program, including, of course, the award-winning tiny drone targeted uh, nanotechnology. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks again for welcoming me here. Uh, uh, so I am, my name is Wilfred Ngoa. I'm, the, uh, I'm a professor and the director of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst Program. And like you've rightly said, you know, well, well described, uh, this program is really a program at Harvard that's designed to catalyze collaborations and initiatives to, you know, close divide or healthcare disparities. And, um, you know, one of the focus areas that we actually have is cancer and other non-communicable diseases. But more recently, you know, we've been looking at um, how we can actually leverage the infrastructure for other uh, communicable diseases like HIV AIDS, you know, for cancer. Because as you may know, uh, cervical cancer actually is a direct, one of the risk factors is HIV AIDS. Um, mm. And like you mentioned, so one of the big things that happened this year at the summit and you were there, we were really excited with uh, the participation and outcomes this year was the launch of the International Phytomedicines Institute. And uh, so this is a really exciting program that, uh, frankly, I was very surprised that, you know, we don't have that in global health yet, right. you know, because, you know, that's something that people can actually really have increased access to and can really reduce disparities. Right. Okay. So, um, you know, I would say that, you know, in terms of the tiny drones to target cancer, I know you asked me two questions. <laughs> uh, it, it's really one way that we, uh, technology can be very important in bridging these disparities and making it increasing access. Yeah. And so in 2015, um, you know, I won the Bright Futures Prize at Harvard Medical School. And this was really, uh, you know, a passion that I've had trying to see how patients who have cancer can have access to treatment. Because as you know, if you are born in Kenya or Cameroon or Tanzania or Pakistan, you know, one of these low and middle income countries and you have cancer, yeah. uh, what happens is that you have a very high chance of dying, mm -hmm. uh, not only dying of the cancer, but a very painful and distressful death. Right. Um, whereas if you are born on Longwood Medical Avenue in Boston, <laughs> you have so many choices. Right. You know, you can go to Brigham, you can go to Dana Faber, you can go to, um, MGH, there are many really high level, you know, hospitals you can go to. Right. So how can you bridge that divide? Um, and then the other thing is that, you know, access to cancer drugs is very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the talks I gave uh, at the summit um, was really talking about, you know, curative cancer treatment for less than $300. You know, everybody was fascinated about uh, yeah, that. Yeah, every, I remember <laughs> everyone was laughing and saying, really? It was yeah. a surprise. And yeah. A prof. yeah, and that's really where the tiny drones, actually when I was talking about that, it's really related to the tiny drones to target cancer. Uh, my colleague earlier on had talked about the work we've done and we're very excited that we are taking that to clinical trials, you know, by the end of this year. Right. Uh, so these tiny drones, so imagine that you have um, drones that are so small mm -hmm. that you can't even see under a microscope. So they're very tiny. They're about 10,000 times smaller than a cell. A cell. So a cell uh, is the most fundamental unit of life that we have in our body. It's amazing. Right. Um, but you can't even see it unless you use a microscope. So these nano drones, they are really uh, 10,000 times smaller than that. And what they can do is exactly what drones can do. You know, they can, you know, they can deliver drugs, in this case, medicines, packages, right. mm -hmm. precisely. You can give a zip code of the cancer or some other disease, um, and uh, it can deliver that precisely to that zip code, so wherever in your body, so disease sites. And secondly, you can actually track it, so you can image and track it, which oh. allows you to see the, the, the distribution of the drug right. um, in your body. So that was a technology we won the prize for in 2015. Um, and I should say the reason, part of the reason, the passion for uh, making sure that this technology is also accessible to low and middle income countries really was also born from that because um, it went, really went through three levels of review. Uh, the first level was, you know, just scientists at Harvard reviewing that and saying, comparing that with um, other proposals that were submitted to kind of determine which were the best. Uh, proposals and then they selected three out of that and then you know they put them out to the public to then decide they said all those three proposals were equally worthy of winning um, you know and they've now put that to the public to decide uh, which one of those were 
could win the, the prize. And we had votes from all 50 states of the United States. Wow, yeah, and that's from amazing. Yeah, and from <laughs> 92 countries across the world. Oh my goodness. And you know what we did, what happened was, one, some of the people who voted from Africa, they said, you know, when we are voting for this new technology for cancer treatment, is it gonna be one of those that after it's been developed, we cannot have access to it? It's gonna be too expensive. Right, and um, which is the case with mes a lot of medications. That's know. right, yeah. It's I mean, in the United States itself. So even though we develop this thinking about cancer patients who don't have access, it includes the United States. Right. We know resource poor communities here, African Americans, you know, you know, people, frankly, anybody in low income settings here in the United States. Mm -hmm. um, or oh, frankly, anybody would like to save money, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so when I give that talk on that night, I basically ask, when you are diagnosed with cancer, you have to ask two things. You know, should I see a doctor or should I see my financial advisor? You know, <laughs> I remember that's that. That's the question yeah. you ask and yourself here in the United States. Um, it is a difficult question. Honestly, some analysts have shown that, you know, you should talk to your financial advisor first. Which is sad. Which is sad. Because it's healthcare, it's yeah. life. You should not, that should not be your first concern, you know. And so, yeah, so we're very excited that, you know, we developed this technology. We've tested that in, you know, animals, preclinical trials, um, you know, and we show now that this can really cure, um, you know, it's really amazing. It can eliminate cancer in other parts of your body. So it's really like training your immune system. Right. Uh, these drones deliver the drugs to the cancer cells. They damage them. Um, and then, like when you take a flu shot, you know, they can, you can bring your white blood cells, your immune system can actually get trained. And then wherever the cancer is in your body, uh, your white blood cells, which are like the SWAT team in your body, can eliminate those cancer cells because now they recognize the cancer. As you know, cancer is really one of your cells yeah. um, that goes rogue, you know, basically doesn't want to die, just keeps multiplying. But the problem is that, um, you know, your, your immune system, your white blood cells, they cannot, they think that it's part of your body. So they cannot, re they don't attack it like they'll attack other diseases. Right. Um, so with this drone technology, we can actually um, train, you know, your white blood cells to recognize the cancer as, as deadly. Yep. So it's more, you know, you've heard about immunotherapy won the Nobel yep. Prize last year, mm -hmm. uh, but this is really, this technology is gonna make that more accessible Right. You know, so it's actually a very low cost technology. And that, you know, when you say low cost, that has been, that has raised a lot of question marks with people who are having a conversation after your presentation. Absolutely. Some yeah. were concerned that uh, yeah. the people who benefit from cancer treatment are probably not going to let you develop uh, that absolutely. technology yeah. because um, it kills their market. Yeah. Do you have similar concerns? Yeah, actually, you're very right. I mean, we've had that um, discussion and you know, this drone technology we developed, uh, you know, we had two options. One is to actually license that. So right now we have companies that are interested in licensing the technology. And uh, I have not accepted that, partly working with other, or other team members um, and, and, and the industry office, partly because once you license this technology, um, you know, you really lose control of that. So, yep. you know, it can be, they can put in a price to it. They can even share of it. Yep. You know, some companies can share of that technology <laughs> and oh, just good. continue with their expensive drugs, right? right. So we kind of decided that we're not going to do that. Um, but, you know, that's the concern is that, you know, once you start doing this, you know, it can disrupt the businesses of big pharmaceutical companies. Right. But we actually want to work with them. And, and frankly, most of these companies, uh, you know, they are also interested in making sure that patients have access to treatment. Right. Uh, so in this case, we would like to actually, uh, we found some partners that we think that can alleviate that concern. You know, people already have a big market, but are also, you know, very interested in making sure that patients have access, especially you in lower mid income looking. countries. Yeah. yeah. We've been talking about the International Fight for Medicines Institute. Yeah. What gave you the idea for establishing this? Yeah. And what is its mission? Yeah, it's really, that's a good question. I mean, this is really two reasons. Um, one of them, Actually, it's really um, about three years ago, um, you know, we, we thought, we started looking, somebody approached us and said, a company approached us and said, this tiny drone technology that you've developed for cancer, can you think about using that to deliver cannabinoids? So these are extracted from cannabis. Right. Um, 
So you can deliver that precisely, you know, whether it's to pain or to neurological disease targets mm -hmm. or to cancer itself. Can you deliver that there so that you minimize the side effects? You know, I mean, it's regulated, it's well regulated, it's, it's a schedule one drug, uh, partly because there are concerns of the side effects, right? right. Um, you know, which frankly is made it very difficult for the research to be done. So this company <laughs> approached us and we say, yeah, why not? These tiny drones are like, you can imagine it like an Uber, mm. right? So you can carry, the passengers can be a cancer drug mm. or it can be cannabinoids, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so we decided to start looking into that, you know, and we've kind of published a number of uh, papers on that. And we showed that, yeah, it can actually increase the efficacy, right? So cannabis is actually a very good example of a plant-based medicine. So phytomedicines, phyto is plant, right? Mm -hmm. So plant medicine. So, you know, it's one of those that, uh, you know, you can actually use to, you know, frankly address a lot of diseases, you know? And so that's the first plant medicine that we highlighted at the summit, even at the launch this yeah. year, right? Mm -hmm. And then the second one uh, is really um, also mind blowing. It actually started from a developing country in Cameroon. Um, so what happened is that the people there actually use, you know, if you go and talk to somebody, I mean, I grew up You're in the village. You're from Cameroon. Right, <laughs> yeah. So if you grew up, you know, 80% of the population actually, um, you know, you use, you use uh, plant medicine. So if, if you're sick, you know, you know, your dad or your mom, they ask you to go behind the house and they, they, they know some plant that if you change into some tea, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they can, you can drink and that makes you feel better. Somehow, uh, it works. People know that it works, but you know the truth is they don't really know what works in it, right? So, um, so we we did. So I, when when I traveled to Cameroon some time ago, I actually found that people were drinking, you know, um, they were drinking that tea, tea, you know, from a plant. So I asked, "What are you drinking?" And they said, "Oh, this is what uh, treated my, uh, you know, I had an accident and you know um, I lost a lot of blood, and this is what restored my blood." And I said, hmm, how is that? You know, I mean, from a scientist's point of view, right? So yeah. I'm really looking at that and being very skeptical. Because um, we so have similar plants in Uganda. If you, you do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're anemic, they'll say drink this. Yeah. Actually, when we started talking about this, a number of people have talked about that. You know, mm -hmm. like they have plants, you know, that they use, you know, to, to treat anemia. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I was very skeptical. Um, and um, so and then everybody started looking at me instead surprised that I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> Say, did you grow up here? Did you, you know, do you? Um, and so I said, well, you know, I'm going to investigate, right? So that's the great thing we have about United States or Harvard, for example. Right. I mean, you have this really, um, you know, great science and technology, right? Yep. That you can actually really bring to this whole thing. And so we decided I was going to investigate that. So I brought it back to Boston um, and and so, you know, gave it to one of my associates who actually when she was going to the uh, lab to analyze it, uh, the lab people said, no, we don't treat, we don't analyze blood here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so she had, to, she, had to, she had to say, no, 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 it's not blood. Um, but the interesting thing is when they analyzed that, it was remarkable, right? So they found out that, you know, it actually has um, about over seven times more hemoglobin than the human body. Wow. Um, and so that explained, we now know, for example, why people are finding some benefit in that, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But this is something that, um, I mean, the World Health Organization talks about, you know, two billion people in the world are anemic. Wow. So one out of every three or four people, right? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that most of these countries in Africa where this plant was actually discovered are anemic, are the most anemic. That's so some of them have in that community, but they don't know. You know, yeah. they, don't know that, they don't know that it works. What, I mean, it's not widely used. Yeah. And now with this discovery, you know, um, now we actually want to bring that such that it can benefit even people in the United States, right? right? Mm -hmm. uh, so there are, I can tell you a list of applications that people are coming up with. You know, it's just amazing. Um, but that was one of the other plants that we highlighted at the summit, right? right? So, um, you know, we now have the science for that. Uh, you know, pop we have a number of, actually this year uh, in the fall, we have a TED style talk at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Oh, excellent. Um, presenting this to the world, essentially. 
uh, talking this about this particular blood. one, the the blood one. Yeah, the oh. blood one. Yeah. Excellent. When is the event? That's our, that's going to be in uh, November. Discover okay. Brigham. So it's going to be a big, big uh, unveiling of it. I mean, before that, we actually have a number of conferences. There's one next month mm -hmm. that we're going to be presenting some of the results there. Um, Still at in Boston. That's going to be in San Antonio, in Texas. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Sure, I can make it. Yeah, <laughs> that's going to be far. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll share the data with you. Yeah. Uh, you know, so it's fascinating. So those were two, you know, triggers mm -hmm. that we started thinking. Okay, you know, global health catalyst program is right. really trying to bridge disparities, yeah. increase access to care for patients and people. But you have these plants that people, even farmers, grow whether it's cannabis, whether it's uh, this plant that grows behind your backyard. Uh, if you can tell these people, you know, what dose or what the bioactive components, what's really helping them, right. you know, treat their disease and what any side effects are in that, what will happen in that case is that you really empower these people. They're going to have access to it, yep. right? And like you mentioned in your introduction, this can actually be a source of uh, jobs and you know, could create jobs for women, yeah. you know, farmers, yeah. you know, you can grow that, you can uh, convert that into something that can benefit, frankly, the whole world. Uh, and, and possibly so also help with uh, preserving some indigenous plants. Yeah. Because right now yeah. people, t uh, they don't care. Some of them are thought to be weeds, but when they're actually medicinal. That's right. So yeah. yeah, somebody went to get some more, some of the people are trying to get this to, uh, you know, because actually have clearance from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to import some of this now. So we have, you know, Excellent. so somebody wants to send that here, you know, and you go to collect the person say, no, that's okay. That's just grass. You can, you can take it away. They don't know the value of it yet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, but, you know, some, that's one of the things we really have to do right. is preserve those, uh, that indigenous knowledge. Right. Um, How can the public be a part of this uh, mission? Yeah. So, yeah. So, uh, actually, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, and one thing I would like to say is that, um, so that w those were just the two plants that we highlighted during the launch. It created this uh, trigger to say, hey, look, you know, uh, if we can elevate this to global health, is gonna really breach these disparities right. in healthcare. And so that was just these two plans. But how can the public help, help, mm -hmm. help is that, you know, this is just the beginning. So now we've had partnerships with s industry, the number of industry, right. as you may know, during the launching, we had uh, $6 million in commitment from different industry that has gone up to about 10 million since then. Oh, wow, um, okay, and good job. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So these people are, they are really interested. Part of it is obviously, there's a lot of interest in uh, even just the cannabis industry, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a wave that's coming now, right? Yeah, I mean, I told you, I'm a, I had a, a conversation with the, mm -hmm. the minister of in Jamaica. Of Jamaica, yeah, yeah. yeah. You and heard the talk, yeah. Yeah, we had, yeah, we had a bit of a conversation and he was talking about the history of uh, cannabis treatment mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in Jamaica and how the stigma associated with cannabis and uh, we you've there's been a whole conversation about whether to legalize it in the United States or not yeah. and uh, so it's interesting you know when you bring out the health benefits of it uh, because many of us do not actually know the health benefits of yeah. it yeah. in moderation of course right. yeah so I mean I think that every plant frankly each one of us there's always a good side and some t and some side maybe side effects of mm -hmm. any plant right yeah. Um, and the thing that the challenge for us, and that's what, you know, Harvard and all the partners that we have brought in this Phytomedicines Institute uh, initiative, that they can bring is that, you know, you can isolate the best parts of each of these plants, right? right. You can isolate those good parts, those medicinal components, and then you can, you can use that in an effective way to, to, to treat can cancer or whatever disease, right. and then you can minimize those side effects. Uh, we don't have to blanket stigmatize. <laughs> you know, I was talking to somebody and he was actually telling me that, why do you want to minimize the side effects? Maybe I want them. You know, but, you know, but that's, that's what we bring here. I mean, the, the Jamaica minister was very powerful in her talk, his talk during the launch. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, I mean, cannabis has been used for thousands of years, right? right. Um, people have used it, you know, and uh, it's kind of surprising that it's only now mm -hmm. that, you know, there's this momentum towards, um, and frankly, any company that's just growing this, I think that they need to think carefully about really bringing the science, the evidence yep. to it, mm -hmm. right? So now we are at a position where, you know, these companies that are signing all these commitments and 
and, and funding with, 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 with Harvard and our partner institutions are saying, you know what, we actually don't want to just use this blindly, right? Yep. We want to bring the science to it. So that when you're using it, you know what the dose is that's mm -hmm. effective for each indication, you know. Um, you want to know what the side effects are. And even for this other plan that I mentioned to you, just imagine yep. that I can go back to that community and tell them that, hey, this is why it works, yep. right? Mm -hmm. This is the right dose. These are side effects that you don't know are happening. Mm. Um, you know, yeah. you empower that community with right. so much knowledge. You know, and we have the technology. We have artificial intelligence. We have genetic profiling. We have, I mean, think about it. We have all of those infrastructure yeah. uh, uh, in Harvard. So, so we are very excited about this launching, and it's really growing. I mean, the partnerships right now we have to basically screen. You know, I mean, we've established a mechanism to make sure that you know it's a uniform standard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're very excited about that. And I think that, you know, it can transform global health, really. Right. It will transform global health because, you know, there's a wave now, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and, and that is something that can become accessible, you know, to populations right. even in low and middle income countries. Right. You know. So are you still looking for more partners? Right. So to, to your question, um, you know, so that, that was a long way to come around and answer your question. So to your question, how can the public benefit? So there are many ways. So one, for example, is that, I mean, we just started with two plans, right? Actually, since then, we've had, uh, I can tell you, we've had people submit plans. Uh, I was actually talking to one of the ambassadors, and he told me about two plans that he has. One, uh, you know, it's, I think he mentioned it was cassava leaves. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> that they used it when he grew up uh, in, one in, African, in Africa. They used that for something. So people are sending us things now that we have analyzed. That's where we've brought in artificial intelligence. I can tell you, we have to kind of screen, you know. But we welcome the public, you right. know. And so you can go to, you know, the Global Health Catalyst website at Harvard, and you can actually contact us so you can submit the plan. So we're going to share the link with you and your, your listeners. And then um, second, thi second thing that's very important, and I, and I really want to emphasize that, um, is that this ambassador actually shared with us a story. Um, he said that, you know, recently uh, in his country, a pharmaceutical company discovered, you know, one of these plants um, that was really high, high in medicinal value. And then they actually sued, you know, the government and won rights over it. <laughs> oh no. So that the, the wow. populations in that country now have to pay significant amounts of money and may not even have access to the medicinal value coming out of that plant, which is in their country. That's and absurd. Yeah. And so actually when we had the meeting with this ambassador, um, there was another uh, company that was there that said, you know, there are ways that you can bypass that, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, w I say that story because I want to emphasize this. If you, you know, if you are somebody who knows a medicinal plant, okay, and you submit that to the Institute for characterization and determining what are the bioactive components, you know, if we determine that truly, there's a medicinal value in this, and there's the evidence. Mm -hmm. We want to make sure that the intellectual property is shared right. with you or your community, community. Okay. or your country. Excellent. You know, because yeah, that's, we want to make really sure that helpful. that happens. Because, you know, if you don't do that, um, and I know that that's actually what, you know, growing up in the village myself, you know, I knew that, you know, some of these people, they, sh they hide. They tell you, they know what can help, but you know, the doctors, uh, the traditional doctors or people there, they would not share that knowledge to you yep. because that's the only way they can generate income, mm -hmm. you know. And, and frankly, so, I mean, it's their IP. They mm -hmm. have the right to hide <laughs> that intellectual right. property. So, you know, f for me to just tell you, okay, if you know a medicinal plant, give it to us to investigate. I have to make sure that I tell you we have to sign some kind of agreement. Yeah. Uh, and each one of even the industry partners we have had to sign a sponsored research agreement with one of the Harvard institutions to make sure that, you know, this is done properly. Right. So that any intellectual property that's developed from that, the community or the person also benefits from it. Right. You and know, so it means if somebody buys a, a, a product from it for $100, you know, the community should get some, some percentage of that. Yes. So it is, is that applicable to uh, communities that are from other parts of the world, that it, other continents that are not just Africa? Yeah. Like Asia, Middle yeah. East. Yeah. So you may have actually met my uh, colleague from the Harvard, uh, Bashkim Yes. Yeah. Very, very yeah. interesting. So he, uh, he, yeah, he's excited about you know that in, in North Macedonia. So we had yes. a really strong. Uh, that's one of the countries that for the first time we actually extended 
um, you know, the global health, the impact, not just in Africa. Yeah. And now we are looking at South America, and then we went to East Europe because I mean, people there also face the same kind of disparities. Yeah. And so he's very excited about, you know, these two plans that we launched and other ones, uh, and he wants to take that to Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, they already, I can tell you the cannabis industry is already up there, but now he's excited about the idea that you can really bring some strong evidence base to it, right. some science to that, right? And, and also these other plants, you know, so um, yeah. I mean, it's not going to benefit only, you know, African countries or right. Asian countries. I mean, that's why it's global. You know, you may have heard uh, Congresswoman Bass, uh, you know, speak, talk at the, at the conference. Mm. Global health is local health. Yes, it is. Yes. I mean, the world has grown up in such a way that it's a global village now. So it is. discoveries made 4,000 miles away in Cameroon or in Macedonia. Or in Uganda. In, or in Uganda, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, Uganda has legalized marijuana yeah, i, I there know you go. i've heard that there's been some kind of agreement with canada so there is a business kind of yeah, there relationship you go. there you go and uh that's uh, that was surprising to me and interesting at the same time yeah. because uh, because of the stigma uh, tied to marijuana yeah, it's but i think change, we're, I mean. we are we've yeah. gone beyond that and right. uh, they're looking at um, the positive side absolutely it, and then try to regulate the usage and you all should that. regulate the use yeah, absolutely so you have to do that you so know um, <laughs> and i think that the, the great thing about this is just that um i believe that each plant has some good i mean each of these plants has some good value and there may be some side effects right, right? but we can distinguish we can isolate what's good yes and use it we cannot just blanket say we don't want to use anything and i can tell you this so frankly only 15 percent of plants actually have been characterized, you know, according to the statistics. Just 15% are known to have been characterized. And so this research that we actually did here, we did it with the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, mm -hmm. right? So they have all these technology where they can characterize in a plant. If you submit your plant, you know, we can just characterize and say what's the family, the genus, the species. Right. You can classify it right away based right. on their DNA analysis. And then we can put it out there in the museum where if you go there, you can see precisely what the species is. So it turns out that this plant, you know, which is actually in the they identified the, g the genus for it, the justitia. But until now, they don't know the, spe the species of this plant because there are about 600 species of each of these plants. Wow. And it's possible that this has evolved. Yes. And plants do that. They mm -hmm. adapt to different environments. So it's evolved and it's become a unique species, right? Wow, okay. You know, so they are all these species that people have not actually characterized, mm -hmm. you know, they don't even know about it. So what you read in those books is what is known, what is but known? actually what's unknown is quite large. Yeah, it may, <laughs> I, I just think of one community specifically in Africa, the Sun people mm -hmm. who are characterized as Bushmen. Okay, yeah, yeah, but they are the yeah. Sun community. Yeah. Those, they are, uh, we've been told by the time they're 18, they can identify 500 species because they wow. live with the, you know, they know their environment. So if I was, you know, in the field of plant yeah. research, I would go to these communities. Yeah, you uh, make a very good point. So actually the, there's the research now. So I know a number of people who are doing this plant pharmacopedia or something like that, right? So actually the National Science Foundation in yeah. the United States has sponsored, and I know people who they have sponsored to kind of um, make sure that they can, um, you know, get these plants and put them in some, encyclopedia like yeah. you know correct make sure that they don't lose that knowledge and i was talking to somebody this weekend who told me that they are even doing linguistics they went and found a plant which um, in that you know it says the name of the plant they gave a name they, they, they characterized the name of the plant by saying this treats something yes okay so if you learn the linguistics of that village that community you know that it treats that something but it turns out that what it's the word that they used that it treats it's no longer available. People don't know what it means. Yes. Because they've over time they've lost the language. They've lost the language. And so now they are now going back to find out, interviewing people who have so many people in the community to find out what the name that means. You know, yeah. so you make a very important point that we really need to, um, you know, record these things and make mm -hmm. sure that we have, have them in some kind of database. And I know that they are doing that, you know, many... Um, organizations, even the Smithsonian yeah. Institute, they're trying to characterize Although it. what hurts me with some of this, they do not credit those local people. I know, and that's why sometimes um, uh, I'm not so eager to, you know, yeah. even give ideas on, say, <laughs> do this, because, I yeah. mean, yeah. It, 
it, it would help the, pe the local communities if, if they told you in their local languages instead of giving them a, a bar of cereal and go away with their knowledge and give them expensive drugs i know if if people in the healthcare profession would be so lenient and yeah. merciful and human yeah. to actually do something, give back right. in terms of healthcare, right. you know, proper healthcare, that would be great. So yeah. I am hoping, of course, that uh, the Global Health Catalyst program is going to pave a way of how things need to be done, yeah. you know, to save our communities. Yeah. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a yeah, conversation yeah. for Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. That's a very important point. And I think that, uh, you know, one thing I would argue is that, you know, I would, I would mention is that, yeah, there's, there's going to be a grassroots movement here. You know what I mean? I mean, definitely you're going to, there's an example of also of the pygmies in yeah. Cameroon. Yes. Where, you know, for malaria, you know, how did they live in those rainforests? You know, how did they survive malaria? And in Uganda. Right, and yeah. Uganda, yeah, right. We have the battle. So, so they, the story goes that actually that's how things like Quinine were mm -hmm. discovered. Mm -hmm. But, you know, those communities never really got any intellectual property back. They had nothing, right? That's just the way the world is, of course, you know. know. Uh, and and, and we, we, we really want to make sure that, that's why we make sure that each partner, as long as, you know, what you're proposing has some, uh, uh, we can find value, value in that. In it, yeah. We wanna make sure that, you know, we sign that agreement with you and make sure that you get the intellectual property. So the public can really help. This is gonna, so from July 1st, we're actually going to have this platform. I'm going to send you, the, you're going to have the address uh, where people can submit. That's the way you can contribute, right? Yes. And I think that, you know, we already have a number of people submitting this, and this can really help, you know, advance not only uh, reducing the disparities, but it can actually, for one way, make developing countries also contribute to global health significantly. Yes. Because I'm telling you, like, these plant, these discoveries we're making in local communities in Africa, right, they can actually have huge impact here in the United States. I believe so. Right. I we can have tell a you, lot in Africa. Yeah. They, I can tell you the list of applications for this, um, you know, <laughs> really. I mean, I can tell you the list of applications for this. I mean, anemia is just the beginning of it. You yep. know, people have talked about secret cell disease. Oh, yes. Right? Uh, um, developing a blood substitute. So, you know, people who even have religious objections mm. or the military oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. or the military, blood transfusion, right? Oh, Things yes. like that. So, you know, it turns out and that we found out from the structure of these, um, these mo the molecules from this plant that they have a strong hemoglobin component that is actually stabilized. That's something that you can develop uh, further. Wow. So there's tremendous potential in this thing that can really benefit. Oh, yeah. um, so. I'm, yeah. I feel almost energized to leave everything I'm doing and just go back to the villages and ask as many <laughs> questions and <laughs> come back with li like a book, a uh, list of all these plants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to utilize our grandparents and great grandparents, to those that yeah. are still alive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a grandfather who I saw drinking the tea. Yeah. You know, like, you know, he actually, I think he needs to, I mean, one year from now, I mean, I think a few months from now, you know, we need to recognize that community and him, yes. you know, for, for bringing this to the global health. And stage. also take back some of the, uh, the projects. You know the problem, Vivian? <laughs> you know the problem? No. One of the problems is this. So, you know, trying to give back the IP. So actually right now, we're thinking about this very strongly. Yeah. Who in that community should we give the IP to? And that's a question that, you know, it's a debate, you know, can bring debate. Right. Because one, you can say, you know, this was discovered in Cameroon, so let the Cameroonian government get the IP. Or you can say, let the community uh, that has it get the IP. Or you can say the individual, you know, so that's something that, you know, we need to kind of work out. And you wanna make sure that, honestly, if, frankly, if you, give the IP back, that it actually goes back to that community. Yes. You don't want to make sure, want to make sure that if you give it to a government, for example, we want to make sure that the community benefits. And, and there are many, you know, government leaders that are responsible, but that's a debate that needs to be had. Right. And I think that that's one of the things that we want to really, uh, you know, come up with a solution for. Right. And, and I welcome suggestions. To oh that. yeah, I can think <laughs> of, I can think of a few that are non-profit with that plan. There you go. And then, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And somebody mentioned that this weekend. So he said, <laughs> why don't you just, we can create a non-profit. Yes. Right. That gives back to the community. Yes. So for, you know, the money that you get, you know, the royalty or whatever you're giving to the IP for that, co for that, for that community, that will be in charge of making sure that, you know, it helps 
particular community, whether it's empowering women, mm -hmm. right? Creating jobs or right. supporting disease, healthcare, whatever. But that should go back to that community. And yes. if it goes to that community, it benefits the country too. Mm -hmm. It does. So you can create a nonprofit, for example, in Cameroon, in this case, right? Yep. That's one suggestion people mm -hmm. get. Uh, but you know we need more suggestions so you, right. are, you just mentioned it too so that's why you know, yeah. so it looks like that's a good idea yeah we're gonna keep <laughs> brainstorming I mean we <laughs> yeah nonprofits usually yeah. are that uh, because you don't have much of um, interference and going through the the bureaucracies of government mm -hmm. and at the same time because sometimes the bureaucracies of, of government have led to people not accessing proper health care quickly so Again, um, but with nonprofit, as long as the the leadership is in the right place, the hearts are in the right place, then they do the actual legwork quickly, yeah, and the yeah. the communities benefit faster. Yeah. I think, in yeah. my opinion, absolutely. <laughs> but anyway, we, there is, again, <laughs> there is a lot. <laughs> we'll yeah. we'll brainstorm some more. But yeah, um, yeah. where will this institute, the vital, the International Vital Medicines Institute, be located? The institute is really based. So one of the hubs is Harvard. Okay. We'll have partners uh, from University of Pennsylvania, Baylor College of Medicine. I know you interviewed my colleague, Eric Tanifo. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, yes, you know, uh, he and I basically, we, it's one of the partners, okay. you know, collaborating here. And then we have uh, from Purdue University. Okay. And then uh, outside of the United States, these are some of the country, these are some of the institutions here in the United States, uh, University of Massachusetts also. Oh. Yay. And then outside of the country, we have Oxford University, we have University of Heidelberg. Um, and now with the colleagues uh, like Bashkin, they are trying to be partners from Eastern Europe. Uh, and then in Africa, we have, you know, basically a number of the countries there, um, the ambassadors were there, yes. you know, so we are actually going to be taking that across Africa with the Pan-African ambassador, Braylin, uh, we unite. Very uh, <laughs> energetic lady. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, She's very inspirational. Right. So, <laughs> so, so this institute is really structured in such a way that there's a major hub at Harvard. Obviously, they have we have the technology there and the science and everything, but it's really an international, it's a really a global thing. It's really a global health mm -hmm. uh, you know, institute here, which um, is gonna be have partners from different places. Um, what was the second question? Um, what, how is it going to bridge the gap? Yeah, so I'll give an example. So one example, let's take the cannabis. You know, uh, you know people have been, that's something that people grow. Uh, actually, uh, during the summit, you know, the. Uh, somebody from Nigeria said that um, the internet was almost breaking in Nigeria because <laughs> there's a debate, you know, because one of the governors <laughs> in that country has said that, you know, they should legalize medical cannabis. Oh, okay. And then, but because of the stigma and the cultural and all of that, so there's a huge debate. So somebody sent the link of the summit to Nigeria and they were saying, hey, look what's happening at Harvard. You know, they are talking about <laughs> this thing. You guys didn't think it's serious. And then there was this big debate, right? right. Um, but I'll give an example there. Um, so, you know, one of the things, the, um, you know, most of the studies have shown that um, it's beneficial for pain management. Okay. Uh, obviously, from, the, the, uh, from our perspective in doing cancer, you know, we know that it can help alleviate the side effects of chemotherapy or yeah. radiation therapy and all mm -hmm. of those things. So those are things that there's already some science to mm -hmm. it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, okay, let me take the, ca the case of pain. So instead of opioids, which people cannot access, right, in most of these developing countries, right, if you actually did the science and you showed them that this is what works, right? People can, you know, actually have access to that in these countries. Where now you don't have to die a painful and distressful death from mm. cancer, right. right? You can actually just go behind your, your backyard. Mm. You can have access to this. You know, you don't have to wait for opioids to be brought to you from outside from of the outside, country. Yep. Uh, and that can be something that, you know, can really increase access. Yeah. Right. Of course, there's always the fear of misuse. That's very like important. Like you know, that's very important. Yeah. So, you know, in what we're actually doing, we've been able to isolate that. But it becomes very, it's not a costly, costly thing. Right. It's, it's something that, you know, accessible. people can actually set up industry, yeah. you know, and that's what we want to do for each of these plans. We don't only want, you know, the vision. And I should say that the vision of the Institute is to, you know, it's both health and wealth economic development yeah okay so this is actually one of the things where you can actually directly connect they say health is wealth right mm -hmm. you can directly connect the you health know health and the, the economic development directly because you can empower local farmers you know uh, the Berlin talked about the fact that women you know who are most in these developing countries don't really have jobs you know yep. um, and but they are spending time 
you know, if you can give them, you know, to even do the farming, like she, she's one of the leading farmers in Africa, right? So, but she's also educated and all right. of that. So she's been empowered. To answer your question, so that, you know, if you can create, if you can bring the evidence and the science, right. you know, and tell people what is the good part of these plants, the dosage, dosage and the side effects, mm. you can empower those communities to actually have access to that. Yep. Okay. On the other hand, right, so the other example I gave was for this blood plant. Uh, now these communities are using that. If you bring it to the United States, right, so all these other, these applications that I talked to you about, if they develop them, the United States gets to benefit from it yep. in a low cost way, yep. right? So they can get more access to that. I know patients who have died with cancer here in the, in the United States and have had to travel to Mexico or other countries because of lack of access to care, you know? Um, because they can't pay for, they cannot pay for the treatments. Mm -hmm. So any low cost technologies that are developed or, medic or treatments that are developed in global health can actually truly benefit global health, can yeah. make even populations here in the United States have access. Uh, so we're very excited about that because it's one of those areas where, you know, it's not just foreign aid. Yep. It's not, you know, just you going to help in a poor country, but um, discoveries made in those poor countries can actually benefit the United States as well. Right. So. Um, so we're very excited about, those are just two examples, of course. But of course, yeah. but it gives us an idea yeah. of, you know, how it can, it will be bridging the gap. Yeah. And of course, um, in your experience as a global health professional, why is it important for the communities to invest in learning about plants and the environmental protection? Oh, I yeah. know we've kind of talked about it, but. Um, yeah. yeah, biodiversity is just a big, um, a big part. Let me give you one, one application again of this plan. I'm very excited about it. And the TED talk. I can't talk wait about to it. know to learn more yeah. about it. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll be bugging you after this. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> imagine. So, you know, people are actually isolating hemoglobin right now, right? So they're isolating that and making burgers, right? Which are not based with meat. You know, so what actually makes a burger taste that delicious is the hemoglobin okay. in the in the meat. Right. Okay. So imagine that if you have blood from plants that has hemoglobin and you can make ah. burgers from that. So that, you know, you can taste, wow. you can taste these burgers and they will taste as delicious, but you're not using meat from cows. And you know what? Wow. Studies show published from science up to high impact journals like science between 15 and up to 50% of global wo uh, greenhouse emissions and global warming, it's actually coming from the use of production of things like meat, growing animals. Mm -hmm. Because when you grow animals, there are a number they're of factors. Feeding. Yeah, they're feeding, plus the fact that they are, you know, they are using up plants and reducing the oxygen, all of that stuff. So the, there's a number of you know, news reports that show that by 2050, the population of the world will be so large that they can no longer really sustain you know, getting, you know, only from meats, you know. So this example of the plant um, can actually, you know, that's why, you know, vegans, vegetarians, yes. all these people. Yes. So this can provide an, a good alternative to enjoying a burger. Vegetarian burger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they are vegetarian burgers already, right? There are already some of that. But this one, you know, with him in it, so you can eat a vegetarian burger and it will still be very tasty, uh -huh. right, and nice. But... You know, you can actually enjoy the same thing that other people are enjoying when they use meat, right? So as that's actually part of the trend right now, right? People are moving towards, you know, the vegan, yeah, yeah, right. And vegan. Um, but this plant, for example, actually is one of those that, uh, I mean, I have an association now with doing the, the numbers to kind of show how if you were be able to move people from, you know, just looking at uh, using this as part of the hemoglobin in developing foods or meats and things like that, how much in terms of global warming, in how environmentally friendly that would be. That's and that's to your question, because mm -hmm. I mentioned that because you mentioned environmental friendliness, yes. right? Yeah. You know, so growing more plants, you know, actually if you're creating agriculture and making people grow more plants, that's really good because plants produce oxygen, remember? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they take carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and they recycle that and they produce oxygen, mm -hmm. you know, during photosynthesis and that's, a way that you can actually really address some of the environmental problems that we're facing. Yeah. I mean, the science is there. You know, it's uh, it's not. I'm just just telling you that. Right, right, right. Science is there. Yeah. You know, to support that. So, definitely, phytomedicines has multiple. You know, plant medicines has multiple benefits. Yeah. Um, and 
you know, it turns out that this, this, this example of the plant I mentioned, the blood plant, uh, is actually very appropriate to your question yeah. about environmental friendliness. Uh -huh. uh, what is Africa's significance in this project, the fight for medicine? It's pretty big, right? I mean, actually, that's been the focus of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst uh, program that I direct. You know, it's really um, started with, you know, trying, you know, mostly Africa, in mm. particular, as a, an example of a low and middle income countries that are, I mean, Africa with low and middle income countries there really don't have access to cancer care, mm -hmm. right? Let me start with that example because that's where it all started and then mm -hmm. grew. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, so most of the collaborations that have come out of the initiative from Harvard, the Harvard Global Health Catalyst have benefited a lot of countries. You know, have, you know, MOU uh, partnerships with the Ministry of Health in Rwanda, mm -hmm. governments in, you know, Nigeria, you know, Namibia, Kenya, you know, now in develop, you saw the, the, the governor from Kisumu came yes. from Kenya, yes. um, you know, Tanzania. So we have no, a number of countries that are already benefiting from this. Where is Cameroon in all this? <laughs> yeah, and Cameroon as well. Okay, Actually, we're yeah. helping build a cancer center in Cameroon. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know. I thought so. I think I met the missionary doctor. That's correct. And, and yeah, his yeah, team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, yeah, this, this really started from that, uh, benefiting a lot of Africa. But now, um, we cannot, because of the success that we've had over the past years, um, there's now, you saw um, this year, we actually for the first time really began to scale some of what is being successful in Africa, you know, to other places, rural lower middle income countries. Mm -hmm. And so we had a very strong participation this year from Macedonia, where my friend Bashkin came from, yeah. uh, and the Kosovo Balkan region. And then we had very strong participation from Pakistan. Yes. Um, so they, they, we're actually helping them with training oncology health professionals. Um, I had a conversation with the team. You did? OK, mm. great. Mm. And then we have, um, obviously, the my our friends from Jamaica. So we, we're going to have you know, U Harvard and US delegations visiting each of these countries yeah. uh, with industry uh, partners of the Harvard International Phytomedicines Institute. And then we are going to have um, you know, also diaspora leaders, mm -hmm. you know, who are frankly great catalysts. I mean, it's very important to emphasize that because, and that's what I really like about your program because you create visibility of, you know, what's relevant to Africa, but also really that connection, the diaspora. Yep. Uh, you are a diaspora example, yeah. you know, but you are really not only giving back to the community here in the United States, mm -hmm. but you are doing something for your ascending continent, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Which is really, I think, really kudos to what you're doing. Um, Thank you. Yeah, really making, yeah, fr <laughs> frankly, that's really great. So, so we want to engage the diaspora in that, you know. Um, so we are going to have delegations from here visiting each of these countries. The idea is not only to, for the healthcare, but also to advance economic development, yep. you know. So we already have people who are interested in investing in those countries. Um, and so, you know, so that has started with Africa, right? But now, you know, we actually having a lot of interest from outside um, yeah, of I'm Africa as well. When I talk to the Pakistani team, th they are involving their diaspora as well. Right. So Yeah, there's a huge one here yes. in, in around Boston as right. well. Right. Yeah. So yeah. And then another place is Bangladesh. So we're also going to Southeast Asia. Yeah. They had a very strong participation this year. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, they're planning to organize a Global Health Catalyst Summit in, 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 in Bangladesh. Excellent. Yeah, and they're going to be part of the Global Oncology University that we launched oh, okay. at the summit. Yeah, I forgot uh, to mention that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also big because, you know, um, you know, you need to be able to train the workforce mm -hmm. in these countries. You know, you can't just take, you know, the tiny drones to target ta cancer technology to Cameroon. Mm. You have to be able to train the people locally. Yep to make sure that they can administer that safely to the patients. Mm -hmm. um, and so training is a huge part of, you know, building human capacity to strengthen the healthcare systems there. Right. Yeah. So it's growing outside of Africa, even though Africa, but Africa has been the primary focus mm -hmm. initially. And, um, you know, actually um, trying to work with, you know, the US government. So we're planning to have, um, you know, follow up policy meetings on Capitol Hill, okay. you know, to kind of talk about how this can actually shape you know, United States policy. Um, you may have heard about PEPFAR. Yep, I did. So um, PEPFAR was one of the biggest, uh, was by President Bush. Mm. It was one of those things that actually if you go across Africa, President Bush is very famous for that, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, when he was the president, you know, it's one of those things people did not 
know he was that good. Yeah. But that was saved hundreds of millions of lives in Africa. Yeah, I have interactions and conversations with uh, uh, officials from the State Department, and they highlight yeah. it quite a lot. It's, you it's, know. it's the so. biggest global health initiative that the government ever that, did. That, um, yeah. 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 It's, it's big. And <laughs> so, you know, so we are looking at now and saying, you know, there's a new, from the World Health, Health Organization, now things like cancer and heart di disease, diabetes, so non-communicable diseases actually killing people more now mm -hmm. than communicable diseases yeah. like HIV, HIV AIDS, AIDS and malaria yeah. and all of that stuff yeah. and tuberculosis. So there is need for, you know, a, some kind of refocus mm -hmm. of some priority towards cancer and other non-communicable diseases, right. which is really the the focus also of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. I mean, uh, this is exciting. And of course, uh, I can't wait to be <laughs> working with you during this journey because yeah. uh, it's exciting. Yeah. And in what ways can governments engage? I know you have talked briefly about how you're going to engage the US government. Uh, how, And I know you've had to, uh, to some degree some uh, working relation with other foreign governments. Yeah. So how can more governments, and those that are already there, how can they you know, yeah. participate more and contribute more? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's one of the things that's really unique, I'd say. I mean, there are many global health programs, and frankly, many universities in the United States and Europe, and you know, they have global health programs. But I can tell you, uh, the Harvard Global Health Catalyst actually is one of those programs that has there are three, I mean, there are four focus areas. There's the, the, the care. So we want to make sure that we develop, we can provide, you know, you talk about the tumor boards and all of those things that we can even do a telemedicine system mm. that if you are African in diaspora here, you know, you can turn brain drain into global health gain. You know, you can still contribute to your sending country, for example. Mm -hmm. And doctors here in the United States don't have to travel 4,000 miles to make a difference. We have artificial intelligence now. We have all those things that can help. You just provide that expertise. You can say to your PJs on your Saturday morning in your, in your, in your room mm -hmm. for 30 minutes, you can contribute and have an impact. So we have the care component. Yeah. Uh, we have the research. So we're doing clinical trials. So the Tic Tac is starting up tiny drones technology yeah. is going to be one of them. We have more of clinical trials. The third thing is the... Uh, education. I talked about the Global Oncology University that will launch. We're also going to include the phytomedicines component now and training people how to actually, you know, do these plants more effectively. Right. And then last, which is w to your question, is the outreach. So this is actually one of the global health programs where the outreach really engages government leaders. Mm -hmm. It used to be that you go to a conference and you just have cancer health professionals like me, yeah. you know, I mean, well accomplished. Uh, we talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Right. We find ways to collaborate and it has impact. Mm -hmm. Don't get me wrong. But then we realize that, you know, we're only talking to each other. Yeah. We need to find a way to talk to policymakers. Right. We need to find a way to talk to industry, talk to the diaspora like you okay. um, and try to make sure that, you know, you understand the problems that we're trying to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, this is not about me. It's really about how can we make people have more access to treatment and have impact. You know, people on, honestly, each day, even as we wait for the clinical trial to start at the end of this year, each time another cancer patient dies, mm. um, you know, it always breaks my heart to think about that. They didn't, maybe if they had access, they may not have, right. you know, they may not have died. So government leaders become a very big issue. PEPFAR was an example where, you know, government actually went into global health and saved hundreds of millions of lives. Right. right? So we started deciding that we'll have to engage the governments. So we've had engagements with ministries of health, mm -hmm. governors uh, from different countries. Um, and now and more recently, you know, we've been actually every single year for the past three years, we've had uh, with the constituency for Africa in Washington, we've been engaging Mr. government Mr. leaders. Mr. Melvin, Mr. Melvin Food, Food. Yeah. yeah. He's a very passionate guy about, yes, you, know, <laughs> you know, helping generate U.S. government policy for Africa. Yeah. You know, so we've been shaping, de developing recommendations for the Trump administration and other people in global health. Um, so right now, you know, we know that, um, you know, President Bush did PEPFAR, you know, President Obama did Power Africa and the Young, the YALI program, the the young, Yali, yeah. you know, uh, President Trump, I think, you know, also wants a legacy, you know, yeah. and all the pr other presidents coming after him. Yes. And I think that, you know, there's an opportunity here in non-communicable diseases as well, or, you know, so that things like digital health, Africa has mm -hmm. leapfrogged. Mm -hmm. You know, you and I grew up, I mean, I grew up in the village where we didn't have landlines. 
but now my mom uses Same WhatsApp here. and all of those things, right? Uh, you know, so I it's penetrated. It's village. There you go, right? So <laughs> people have penetrated. So how can you use those technologies more to increase access to healthcare, yeah. right? And then it's this plant medicine thing, which is really big. Mm -hmm. It's like bringing pepper and the Agua Nisha together, right? So, you know, so we really think that engaging the governments is important because they can actually develop these policies mm -hmm. that can really make that more conducive. And we're very uh, excited that a lot of these government leaders it used to be when you invite the ambassador, mm -hmm. they would say, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. This is a global health conference. I don't I know anything about global about health. health. Yeah. yeah. But these are the ambassadors who are now engaging other diaspora and their ministries of health. You know, have a number of these ambassadors who came to the, the summit who are saying, we want to contact our, we want to facilitate the visit mm -hmm. to Mali, to, Zim to Mozambique, to Zimbabwe, to all of these countries, you know, where you can then go with these investors and help, you know, establish collaborations with and our institutions and ministries of health. You know, they have become catalysts. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. We talk about the global health catalyst. They've become catalysts for global health. You know, and that's really a unique thing where you come to the, these programs, which are not now only in Harvard, we do yeah. that in Africa and other places, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter your background, yeah. right? And I, I want to tell your audience, I mean, just come and check it out. Like, you can, we can basically tell you how you can contribute. Right. And you, for example, are doing, you don't even know what, just educating the public. <laughs> it's huge. Yeah. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It is very big. You, know, mean, you don't have to be a cancer health professional. No. Right? You <laughs> don't have to be a phytomedicines expert. Look, you, you actually went and read some books, you know, but, you know, you, you just do what you do best, which is, you know, communicating this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I talk and get excited about it because I, I, I really, we see the impact of it. Um, and so anyway. It's an amazing you know. project. Uh, right. The impact, you, you might not see how impactful it is, but for some of us who have, you know, we think about our families, I'm the only uh, of my siblings, I'm the only one who lives in the United States. Mm. Everyone else is in Uganda. Right. So when there are health issues, I'm concerned because they don't have the right care, right. you know, access to the right care. Right. So when I see projects like this, it's just automatic. And being the oldest, I, I know. it's my wish for, uh, you know, my dream for my siblings to have access to good health care. Rwanda, you know, um, you know, we're actually setting up a mental health thing after the genocide. Oh, um, yes. You know, so a lot of people, mental health is one of the non-communicable diseases that people deal with. Here in the United States, a lot of people die. You know, yeah. think about the military. Um, you know, the, I heard the statistics, 22 veterans kill themselves each day. You know, that's a mental health, part of it is mental yeah. health. Um, but that's also very big in lower middle income countries. In Africa, mm -hmm. for example, you actually stigmatize, mm -hmm. you know, when you have a mental health issue, you're afraid mm -hmm. to come out and talk about that. You know, and people suffer in silence. So, you know, we're developing this collaboration with the Ministry of Health there. We've been helping them train, working in the cancer area, but even cancer is a mental health issue because yeah. if you are diagnosed with cancer, it has major mental health, it, it changes your family's lives. Yes. You know, and so you have to deal with that mental health issue. Um, and so, you know, so this is, this is really important that, you know, we engage these government leaders and these countries to be able to address this. And uh, you know, we're frankly very excited about that. This is uh, this is going to be one of the yeah. longest uh, episodes, but oh. uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> but it's also in, in, you know yeah. it's necessary to yeah. have this to have this conversation and to bring this to the attention of many people who mm -hmm. who are not aware of what is going on and who are not aware of ways they can contribute. We have this um, this article coming out, you know, very soon. Um, you know, talking about this plant. Uh, I'm very excited about it. Uh, so I think I that <laughs> we're going to push <laughs> that to you. Yeah. So you can see some of the things I told you about the potential applications. Right. This is the example of why we created this Phytomedicines Institute, International Phytomedicines, because it's a good example where you get something from, from Africa or from some lower middle income country that can Save not only world. benefit Africa, but can benefit the world. And we're very excited about the potential of this particular one, you know. So, yes. you know, we'll probably have opportunity to talk more about those Absolutely, things. because <laughs> yes, I'm, I, I would love to talk and about... And I know you mentioned during the... Sorry for interrupting. No there. worries. So uh, you mentioned about, you know, once we have the clinical trials for this start, we're coming to talk to you again. So, yes. yeah, we're yes. going to be highlighting that because it's very important to educate the public. Yes, I am looking forward to the clinical trial yeah. period. I know it's in November. Yeah, so yeah. We're, we're aiming for so November. Um, and, you know, we'll start at Harvard and then we have a number of partners already. Um, 
you know, so we want to make sure that these low and middle income countries have access to. So we're going to set up centers in, so the Cameroon, okay. you know, the Cameroon you mentioned. So mm -hmm. where else? Of course, of course. <laughs> so, so, so a it little bit, a little bias there. If, if you didn't go to <laughs> yeah, a little bias there. Uh -huh. uh, so Nigeria, you know, Kenya you know, Tanzania, so we have a number of partners there. I'm sad that Uganda is not there yet, but... Yeah, yeah, so we're going to engage, yeah, we're going to have, yeah. we're going to engage. Actually, we invited the Ministry of Health uh, this year, but, you know, I think we'll get, they'll be able to participate, next. hopefully, in the next time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, we're actually engaging, you know, East Africa region a lot, you know. Um, yeah. The governor who came, you know, he's organizing, he's inviting us to come to uh, Kenya, uh, and we have partnerships that we're developing now with them. Um, so that's pretty close to Uganda. Yes. Um, and then the next place we would come to Uganda. <laughs> and there, I think you already have a working relation with Rwanda. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's I'm a big one. That's, that's actually where, you know, one of the, the governments that's very, you know, the Minister of Health is actually one of the honorary ambassadors of the Harvard Global Health Catalyst because, yeah. mm -hmm. I mean, she's just fascinating. I mean, they have a good government that I think when I was there, I actually really wish, you know, that, you know, I mean, Rwanda is great. Yeah. Like, you need to visit it. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I, you know, I wish that more countries can, you know, have such government leaders to work mm -hmm. with, you know. Yeah, and I met, of course, the neurosurgeon from Rwanda. You met, the, yeah, yeah, the lady, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, Claire, Claire, Claire Dr. Claire, Claire. Yeah. yeah, she's amazing. Yeah. She, at her age and her achievements, yeah. which is simply yeah. amazing. Yeah, she's one of the diaspora who, you know, is really went back and is, you know, digging in and really trying to change the healthcare locally. Yes. So we're excited to be collaborating with people like that yes. as well. Um, yeah. It's an exciting uh, experience and program. And of course, I'm excited to have you here yeah. and uh, to continue working with the Global Health Catalyst yeah. uh, team. Yeah. And uh, so is there anything else you would want our viewers to know that we haven't touched? talked about? Talked yeah. about? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think your viewers, I uh, would just like to, 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 to thank you again and thank your viewers, um, you know, for, I think that's important that they realize just what a great program this is, you know, in being thank able you. to, yeah, no, <laughs> this is great. You know, I mean, you're one of the first, I kept telling you, I mean, maybe, you know, you should really, think about getting a big journalism career, you know, like, you know, I <laughs> yeah, mean, you I have, you are ABA. really multi-talented, you are multi-talented, <laughs> okay. and I guess you have to pick what your gift is. Uh, thank you. But, you know, as a diaspora, I just want to say thank you for, you know, being, for doing this, you know, for being, identifying this talent and using that, yeah. you know, so well, you know, I think it's important. You are actually a catalyst, a bridge between, you know, America and Africa yeah. by doing this, you know, bringing that perspective about Africa to the United States, you know, and, you know, um, you know, Lydia, we know also, we actually wrote a book about, you know, the experiences of Africans in Europe and the United States. And usually, um, and also the experiences, now we have one coming out, which is, we'll tell you about it, about experiences of Westerners in Africa. But usually one thing we identified is the perception. Mm -hmm. It's always very different. Yeah. So I grew up, for example, in Cameroon, thinking that once I arrived in Germany, all you know it's all gold you know my my troubles are ended oh you my know, so you have that perspective you know <laughs> you know from hollywood watching hollywood movies right you know and then at the same time you arrive germany or you know so people have the perception that every everybody in africa lives on trees <laughs> You meet people like that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Who lives in you trees. Have cars. Yeah, they, you know, they, you know, like that, you know. So um you know, but educational programs like this, you know, actually bring a fresh new perspective. People, people sometimes just need to be, to learn more. Yeah. And I think that that's why this program is so important. And I just want to thank you and appreciate that. Thank um, you, sir. And then last thing I would say is that, you know, I really, um, you know, look forward to, you know, I'll be happy to update, you know, all my team members update about, you know, these, um, we're very excited about this Harvard International Phytomedicine Institute at Harvard and our partner institutions. Um, and we really look forward to engaging your audience, you know. <laughs> you know, they can contribute to global health. Absolutely. <laughs> we'll spread the word and we'll make people go talk to their grandparents, great grandparents, yeah, there neighbors, you go. <laughs> aunties, uncles, everyone. It's uh, the whole clan head yeah. so that we get these medicines documented before we lose yeah. that information. Amen so to that. Amen. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the Harvard Medical School's pro uh, Global Health Cut List, you can write to them or check out their website. Yeah, ghc.bwh.harvard.edu.
as the primary address. All right. Um, I can send you that link. Um, okay. Yeah, and then we do have another uh, link to the summit, the Global Health Summit website, which are now organized at Harvard and other countries. Oh, okay. The next one is coming up in Germany. The next one will come up in Nigeria. And then we're going to Kenya next. So it's really, people are really excited um, and looking at how they can collaborate, you know, to eliminate disparities. Excellent. Yeah. Dr. Wilfred, thank yes. you for being my guest on Africa to you. Absolutely. Yeah. And looking forward to hosting you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to it. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> if you uh, want to know more about the diaspora's work, or you can also visit africatou.org. Send me or send me an email at africa to you .vivian at gmail.com. Thank you for watching Africa to you. Till next time. I strongly believe every single plant God put it for a reason. But because we have not taken time to actually go that route, maybe that's all that we need.